Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 28th of September, 2005, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, I'm Charles Francis Rowley. I was born June 1st, 1924. And I was born in a nice little city, Amsterdam, New York. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to any Well, I uh, graduated from uh, Wilbur H. Lynch High School. And uh, after I got on the service, I took the advantage of uh, uh, going to Siena mm -hmm. College. Well, I meant before you went into service. Oh, I, I was in high school. High school. High school. Okay. okay. Um, do you remember where you were? Um, your reaction and how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, I was in the, well, perhaps I should say this. Uh, before Pearl Harbor, in July of 1941, I joined the New York State Guard. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. And I spent a year and a half uh, training uh, to be a soldier. Uh, my brother was in the uh, the 27th Division, mm -hmm. the New York State Guard, right. Right? and they were federalized in October of 1940. And he was a soldier. My father was a soldier, World War I, and I wanted to be a soldier. So when I had the opportunity and they formed the, uh, the State Guard, I joined the State Guard immediately. And I was in there for a year and a half prior to joining the Navy um, in December of 1942. Okay, so um, you, you did training with the Guard and so yes. did you go? Yes, we had, uh, we trained, we went to Camp Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did our firing over at the uh, West Point uh, area and uh, we uh, trained at the Amsterdam Armory, uh, and we, we went on a different uh, bivouac, uh, two weeks training at the... Uh, was it Camp Drum? Was it Camp Drum? No, not Camp Drum. It was in, uh, oh, I can't think of it, 60-some uh, years ago. Uh, It's right adjacent to the, uh, uh, it's in Camp Smith. Uh, this is where we trained. Uh, I'm trying to think of the city. Yeah. I'm trying um, to think of the city that uh, we're using. The city near Smith. I don't know myself. Okay, so um, did you ever go away on maneuvers outside of Camp Smith, outside of the no, state at no, all? Just we stayed pretty much the same, locally okay. in the New York State. The okay. only place close was uh, Shanks, Camp Shanks. Is that it? Camp Smith. Shanks. Oh. It was near Smith. It was the Camp Shanks. Then. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't remember that. okay. Um, well, how did you hear about Pearl Harbor then? Were you in the garden? Well, I was, <laughs> it was uh, a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. We were having our dinner oh, on okay. December 7th. Um, this is when we heard it. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, being that I was in the military, my mother was uh, quite concerned about me having, you know, going mm -hmm. to the service right away. But I hesitated. I was only uh, a junior in high school at the time, I was 17, and when I graduated, uh, I joined the Navy uh, six months after my graduation. Why did you uh, decide to join the Navy since you had your father and brother were in the Army who had been in the your uh, well, all of my friends, uh, the friends of my very good friends, uh, they all joined the Navy and uh, they pretty much convinced me that I should join the Navy. But uh, I feel that the, the, the training that I had in the Army helped me out because it, I was more mature mm -hmm. uh, and I knew how to, to um, uh, take orders and discipline and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just a raw recruit coming off uh, off the streets. So I had the, that, that experience really helped me out. And, uh, and so. okay, where did you go for training? Uh, I went to Samson uh, mm -hmm. 
Okay. Samson in uh, January of 1943. Okay. Um, what was it like at Samson? Cold. <laughs> yes, I imagine. It, I think it was the, the worst winter they've ever had up there. I mean, it was so cold that they wouldn't allow us to go out and do any uh, training out on this, in the mm -hmm. fields. We had to do most of our things uh, in the barracks. So it was uh, extremely cold, and that was for, I think, eight weeks. And, uh, Now, do you think, well, I know you, you did allude to that, but uh, did, did they give you any kind of credit or anything for being in the No, they did. No, they did. It was just that, uh, for me, for it, was, you it yourself. was valuable for me mm -hmm. that, that I had this training, and uh, no, they didn't. Mm -hmm. They used my training. In what uh, way? They found out that, uh, that I was... Uh, that I had training with the uh, guards, mm -hmm. so um, and eventually I became a petty officer based on probably uh, my mm -hmm. experience that I had. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, where did you go from Samson? Uh, well, from Samson, they um, they were selecting people from our outfit to go to certain schools, and I wanted to go to. Uh, a quartermaster school. I wanted to be on the ship on quartermaster, but I found out that uh, I, I had uh, a color blindness, red and green, which are the two primary colors mm -hmm. that navigators need to know. So I, I was refused that, and I thought about going into cooks and baker school because I figured I'd get a nice hot meal and so forth. But one day they came out and they said, uh, we need 300 volunteers to go to the hospital course. And I kept quiet and all of a sudden my name was announced and I wondered why they called me. So I asked the chief later on, I said, uh, how come you selected my name? He said, well, there was something in your high school resume that said that you were interested in medicine. He says, and that, when we saw that, we figured, you know, you'd be a good candidate for Hospital Corps. So this is what happened. I uh, went to different schools um, in the hospital, the hospital corps. Um, now, were you you were not trained as as a, a corpsman corpsman. while in the field, or you were trained right. as a corpsman? Right. What kind of training did you receive? Well, we uh, basically it was working in hospitals, working with doctors, uh, doing all the hospital work that you would normally do. Um, but I, uh, uh, I had uh, almost two years. I was uh, stationed at a um, a small naval base in Florida. Um, it was called Cecil Field. It was, and it was a practice field carrier landing for. Our pilots had just mm -hmm. got their commission and they needed that training, the field carry landings. And it was beautiful. Uh, I had I had things going for me, going to the beach every week. I had a girlfriend there. I had a very good friend. I probably, I'm, in fact I know, I could have stayed there for the rest the duration of the war. Because this, I was there, um, let's see, um, in 1944. So, uh, and the war got over in 1945, so I could have spent my time in, at the beach in, in Florida. Mm -hmm. However, uh, my friend and I, we were anxious, we wanted uh, to participate and do something in the war, so we asked our, our commanding officer, Cap uh, Captain Harding, uh, if he could get us some sea duty, and he said, you know, I just heard that they're forming a special augmented hospital out in California, and they're looking for recruits. Would you be interested in that? And we said, sure. And um, a couple of days later, we got our orders, and we were shipped from Florida to California uh, to a, uh, a camp, Camp Bruno. Uh, 
There, they were putting together a special augmented hospital um, with doctors and corpsmen. We went through six weeks of jungle warfare. No, no, can I ask you a second? What do you mean by an augmented hospital? Uh, it, it means that, that we had all of the rates of the Navy. We had cooks, bakers, uh, electricians, and so forth, mm -hmm. who helped us get uh, setting mm -hmm. up our organization. They, uh, uh, there was, I think, six hospitals all together on Okinawa. We were number three. So this training that we had, uh, we were trained by the CBs at a CB camp. Uh, it was, Mount Diablo was the mountain that we trained. Uh, we were given med our food on mess kits. We didn't eat in the commissaries. Uh, and uh, my first experience of K, K rations, they gave us K rations. Uh, we marched. They gave us extensive training using guns. Well, this is where it came in handy for me when they found out that I handled a gun. So uh, uh, it was six weeks of training, probably not as harsh as the, uh, the Marines would go to the training, mm -hmm. but for somebody that had no idea what we were going through, uh, it was pretty rough for us. Mm -hmm. um, But uh, we went through it, and then uh, when the uh, <coughs> uh, when the hospital was organized and everything was ready, they uh, let's see, it was in uh, March we were commissioned, um, and in April uh, we went aboard a. Uh, a cargo vessel, which was uh, fitted for us. Mm -hmm. We had 249 people, doctors and corpsmen. Uh, the ship was named the Day Star, and it was a merchant marine ship. We had uh, Navy gunners, and that's all we had, mm -hmm. and 249 of us personnel. What was the designation of your unit? Did you have a designation at all? Yes, a special augmented hospital. Oh, that's, a, that's what it was called, okay. It's called the special augmented hospital. Okay, okay. Number okay. three. That's what I got to number three. Okay. So, how long, where did you go from? Well, we left, the ship? we left Port Wainini and it took us eight days, and we stopped at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. We had a few days at Pearl Harbor, um, and then we were on our way uh, to the Pacific. We had no knowledge of what was going to happen. They didn't give us any. We knew we were going to hit some beach of some sort, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we might be in for some trouble. And sailing along, we hit the uh, Anna Wetak and Ulithlis, which was only a couple of days from Okinawa. And then, as we were sailing along, uh, we ran into some real trouble. We knew we were going to be landing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Tokyo Rose, I'm sure many people remember Tokyo Rose. Tokyo Rose named a half a dozen ships who will not make port, and our ship was one of them. She mentioned the Day Star. No, you were in a convoy. We were in a convoy. Mm -hmm. You were in a convoy, and uh, one day out of Okinawa, a kamikaze plane flew over, headed for our ship. And of course, the convoy, all of the ships that knocked the plane down. Mm -hmm. And the plane landed on our starboard side of the ship. We were probably no more than 
three or four hundred feet when that plane blew up and we knew we were in some, for some trouble at that point. Um, the uh, area was, uh, was minefield and submarine depths and so forth, so we had to navigate and do a lot of zigzagging to get there. When we uh, arrived at uh, Buckner Bay, well, it wasn't called Buckner Bay at that time. I'll have to tell you later how it got its name at Buckner Bay. But we landed at Buckner Bay, and we got off our ship onto an LST. We had a very light dinner, or a break, I mean a lunch, no dinner. And we had all our, our gear, and we got on land, now, how close was this to D-Day? Uh, D-Day was April 1st. This was, uh, this was uh, May 29th. Oh, okay. Uh, a day before, two days before my birthday. Uh, in fact, I had my birthday on Okinawa, June 1st. Um, they had, they, they sent five large army trucks to pick us up, to take us to our destination. Well, it was dark, it was rainy, it was cold, wet. Uh, so they loaded us on, this tr on, a, on these five trucks, and of course, there was no roads there. And our drivers all got lost, and our truck was lost. And we were driving along very slowly until uh, we got stopped by some army people who were on patrol. And they wanted to know, where in the heck are you guys going? And we told them, the guy said, we never heard of that. I said, never heard of it. And, and this officer came out and he said to our officer, uh, I suggest that you park your car right here and tomorrow morning go back this way. He says, because you're only about a mile from the front lines. Because we could hear all of the action going on because we didn't know where we were going. And the other four arrived safely at the destination, and we got in, I think, around 12 o'clock, uh, hungry, wet, and of course, uh, we, we had no food. Oh, by the way, we asked this officer if he had any, any food, and he said, all I have is K-rations, and we said, fine. We were used to eating mm -hmm. K rations, so he gave us a box of K rations and we ate care. He says, Don't smoke the cigarettes. He says, uh, But you can eat the food. I mean, this is what we did that night. So when we got back to uh, our destination, um, uh, a special augmented hospital number six was there prior to us. They were there probably a couple of weeks before. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the, the CBs had um, done a lot of construction and they had a uh, a galley set up for us, so we did have some food. But uh, they says, this is where you're going to be living here, and it was all jungle. So uh, we had to put up a, a, a perimeter guard around our compound. And we hospital corpsmen were, because we were trained using guns and so forth, they put us on patrol. And guess who was one of the first guys to go on patrol? Charles Rowley. Because they knew that I had experience, you know. With, uh, now what kind of weapon did you carry? I had a carbine. Mm -hmm. I had a carbine. And uh, they set us on patrol um, at 12 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock the next morning. And like I say, we were holding Dan and uh, we had our shovels so we dug foxholes so we could be, try to get comfortable laying on the ground. Um, and it was uh, very, very tough that first night. Now you said met earlier, you mentioned you selected a carbine over a Thompson. Yes, yes. Why, why did you select it? Well, when I, I, I told this officer, he said, I want all petty officers to have a uh, Thompson submachine mm -hmm. sub gun. And I told him I would rather not have that gun, I said, because it jams at times. And he wanted to know, 
how I knew that. And I, then I told him, I said, I was in the National Guard or State Guards for a, a year and a half, and I know, and I've handled that gun. And he said, what would you want? I said, I'd rather have a, a car meeting. Mm -hmm. So this is what they issued me, a car meeting. This is what I had uh, hitting the beach. So uh, they put us on patrols uh, all around the, our compound. Did you ever wear a designation that you were a medic? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the armband? The or... armband, you're right. Okay. Um, I, I have a picture here. Can I okay, show Okay, well, you? I'm sure you can show it now. Uh, this is... Um, did you have anything painted on your helmets, too? or Paper. Did you paint a designation on your helmet? Oh, uh, no. Or no, or we just had a... Just the armband. armband. Uh, did you make any contact with the enemy that night? Plenty. Uh, this is a photo. Okay. Uh, this is this is what we did. We uh, we had we had to go out uh, in ambulances and pick up the more serious uh, casualties. Uh, now, um, from that photo, you you wore the navy denims. Yeah. Yeah. You wore the navy denims here. Mm -hmm. And and uh, did you wear helmets at all, or not really? We had helmets. They issued us helmets, mm -hmm. but you can you can see like here, we uh, you know we had the regular yeah hats on. But uh, this was this was um, probably after most of the the fighting mm -hmm. and so forth. But uh, when we landed there, there was the, the war was still right. going on pretty well. Yes, we did wear helmets. In fact, the helmets is uh, what they issued us water. They issued us a, a helmet for the water to brush your teeth, wash your face, shave, do whatever you can with it, drink it. And that's all we had was a helmet of water. And they had to transport, transfer that water from, from the ships. So we did have helmets. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty rough uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we could hear the uh, the bombs and so forth that were going on in the distance. But uh, uh, you, we talk about this rifle. This rifle was my companion for just about all the time that I was on Okinawa. I slept with that rifle. Mm -hmm. Because uh, every night, <clears throat> every night we would hear the bombing and so forth, but we would hear uh, Banzai, Banzai. Banzai, and we knew the Japanese were nearby mm -hmm. because a lot of them infiltrated. They wanted to get into our compound because they felt that uh, we were trying to uh, uh, heal and bring our soldiers back. Uh, so uh, they wanted to take out the, our hospitals. So uh, it was pretty dangerous. How did you feel being out on the lines like that? Well, uh, like I say, the, the experience that I had uh, uh, in, the, in the State Guard helped me a, a mm -hmm. lot. I mean, I was scared. I was frightened, uh, like anybody else would be. Um, like you say, at night, you couldn't get any sleep because that's all they did all night long was yell, banzai, banzai, and then we'd hear rifle shots going off and wondered where they where they were where at were they coming into our compound. But um, it was pretty rough. During the day were you ever involved in, in any of the surgical work or the things that were going on within the we, hospital? This is what I, I'm, I'm, I'm the reason why I'm doing this is I want to tribute to the doctors and the corpsmen mm -hmm. who I worked with. The doctors uh, were, were such great people. Uh, they worked along with us. They dug the ditches. They had boosters on their hands. They did everything that we did. Um, so I, this is what I want to do, is to have a tribute to, to, to the doctors and, uh, and the foreman. Uh, yes, we did everything. You know, we worked up the, in the wards. Uh, we had a 500 bed hospital. Uh, we took in mostly uh, 
the most serious casualties. This was primarily what our, our job was because we had doctors who were surgeons, neurosurgeons, uh, orthopedic surgeons. Um, so we had an opportunity to, uh, to work in, on all different uh, areas of the hospital. I worked in the, uh, in the surgical hospital. Uh, I saw several craniotomies and I, I still think and I still see them sometimes. What they had to do back 60 years ago compared to what they're doing mm -hmm. today, how much more advanced we are doing that mm -hmm. type of operation. Back then it was pretty crude. But, uh, In what ways would you say it was crude? Well, uh, opening up the skull, they used a regular, like a saw. And uh, it was very difficult to watch that. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have the, uh, the techniques that they have today. Um, But uh, primarily our job was to, uh, uh, to work in hospitals, take care of the patients, um, and uh, our extra duties were perimeter guards. Um, we had to uh, set up our own tents, uh, and uh, we had no flooring, so we had to go into the villages, uh, some of the houses that were demolished we picked up the wood there and we made a, a flooring for, for our bunk. And we had four people uh, to each tent. And uh, it was um, a, kind of a routine life after, after a while we got, uh, once we started getting patients in. Um, so primarily this is what we did. Uh, eight hours on and eight hours off. And, um, You basically treated them uh, critically wounded. Did you treat um, like uh, fatigue? Yes. Fatigue, um, any of the right. malaria, stuff uh, like that also? Right, or? right. We, had, uh, we had doctors, um, uh, uh, psychiatric doctors. Uh, another thing I want to bring out about the, the medical, but I want to bring this out about uh, chaplains. Without chaplains, I think we would be in a, a real problem. Uh, chaplains were somebody that you could go to uh, with your problems, mm -hmm. and they would listen to you, and uh, we had two chaplains uh, in, our, in our unit. We also had a, a photographer and a reporter assigned to our organization who took a lot of pictures and so forth. Now, did you suffer personally from any sorts of no, tropical disease? No, it was just that it, it, it was very difficult. Uh, it rained so much in Okinawa that you'd get rain and get a little sunshine and rain again. So most of your clothes were wet mm -hmm. and you couldn't wash your clothes because uh, they would be wet again. And uh, so it, it was just uh, very difficult. Uh, we, we tried to. Uh, Build some kind of roads and so forth. The CBs, I must say that I give a lot of credit to the CBs because of what they did. They uh, they transformed uh, this field that we were in, probably the size of maybe uh, three football fields, and it was out in the open, which we found out later that was the wrong place to set our hospital up because the Okinawans told us that. When the big winds come, we will be finished. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, it did. I'll tell you later on yes, what happened um, with the hurricane. But uh, uh, we tried to uh, uh, have some fun. We we had baseball teams and uh, we horseshoes. Everybody had horseshoes in front of their tents. So we played hor we did horseshoes and uh, played a lot of cards. Uh, I guess that's where I learned how to play poker. And um, so we had a chance to idle away the time doing those certain things. Um, they sent us out every day, as you can see the pictures, uh, 
in ambulances to pick up. Um, we also had to go out into, uh, into the fields uh, where the, the actual battle was to pick up patients there. Uh, it was pretty risky and pretty dangerous, but this was our job and, and we've, we felt Now your brother, you said, was in the 27th Division. Did you ever run into him in an hour? No. Was he no. there? Um, when you went out in the ambulances with them marked like that, did the Japanese ever target them? Absolutely. Them Absolutely. Absolutely. That we were a great target for that. And they knew that uh, this was uh, a good assault to mm -hmm. try to, you know, mm -hmm. kill the guys with the Red Cross. But uh, uh, at this time here, uh, most of the uh, fighting It's pretty much over uh, in June, of, uh, 22nd of June or 28th of June or something in that period there, that most of the, uh, the firing, uh, uh, the assaults were done. <clears throat> in fact, I think it was, uh, yeah, I think it was about the middle of June that the, uh, the commanding officer of the Japanese committed Harry Carey. You know what that mm -hmm. okay. Committed Harry Carey and his uh, his deputy also committed at three o'clock in the morning, right in front of their tents. They both of them killed themselves, and they knew that the war was over. We had uh, they had about a hundred, hundred fifty, hundred sixty thousand soldiers on the islands. Um, uh, uh, I, I want to tell a little story about the, uh, the New York State Guard. Mm -hmm. The New York State Guard was on Okinawa. The New York State Guard landed in Okinawa uh, the 10th of April. They had 16,000 troops, which was uh, about 4,000 shy of a division. And the commanding general at that time was a marine general who did not like reserve soldiers. And he relieved the commanding officer of the 27th Division because he says uh, uh, we didn't have the, uh, the suppression lead. Mm -hmm. Didn't go in there fight hard enough. And he argued and said that you guys were not like Marines, and he finally eventually uh, replaced his, uh, our uh, commanding at uh, the 27th. I don't know if my, my brother was not on there because uh, what he did, uh, he went into the Air Force, he got a transfer and uh, he got into the Air Force, so he did not, I don't, he was in the Pacific, mm -hmm. but he was not on Okinawa. Now you talk in, in your form that you sent in, you, you talk quite a bit about the, the uh, typhoon. Well, okay, things were going along pretty well with us. As I say, uh, we had the routine down pretty pat. We were bringing the patients in. And uh, uh, before I get to the typhoon, okay. I, I want to say this, that I was quite disturbed when I heard certain people taking credit for uh, Purple Hearts. To me, a Purple Heart we saw Purple Heart veterans. The commanding officer would come into the hospital and they would present a Purple Heart to the Marines who had an arm off, who had maybe both legs off, who had his head bandaged. He had the Purple Heart. Now he deserves the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. And to me a hero is a person who died. Not a living, there, there's no such thing as a, a hero that's still alive, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes up and says, you know, I, I, I got a purple heart, we had Marines would come in and they'd maybe have a, a shrapnel wound on their arm or somewhere on their body and they said, do we qualify for a purple heart? And our officers would say, Fine, if you bring your commanding officer in here and he feels you deserve a Purple Heart, we'll issue Purple Heart to him. 
But the Purple Hearts were not for them. I mean, somebody that gets a little scratch on his arm and, and wants to go home after he gets three Purple Hearts, goes home and claims he's a hero. Uh, we, we saw a lot of that, so that really bothered me when I, when I hear about people saying, oh, I got a Purple Heart. My brother got a Purple Heart, but he was shot in the hip, and he was wounded. Uh, that's a Purple Heart. But someone that gets it because he's got a scratch on his head or his face and not hospitalized or anything like that, that's, uh, uh, my, this is my feelings. Okay. But uh, as, I, as I say, uh, we, uh, I think it was in July, July 1945, the uh, heavy cruiser, the Indianapolis, mm -hmm. Uh, was sunk right off the coast of Okinawa by a, a Japanese uh, submarine. Uh, we thought the war was over because uh, at the end of June, uh, we felt that the, uh, the Japs came up pretty much on our island. And when we found out about that, I mean, it really, wow, the war is still going on yet. However, um, and then, of course, the atomic bomb that was dropped, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we were there when that all happened. What were your feelings on that? Uh, well, we feel it was, you know, it was part of the war. Um, I feel this way, and I'm certainly most of, most of the people, we felt that it was, uh, uh, it saved a lot of lives because uh, we, were, we were ready for an invasion of Japan. General MacArthur was about ready to go ashore with a million people, and probably a lot of Japanese would be killed. And uh, Harry Truman, uh, I idolize him, and I say he's the greatest person that ever had the job as the president when he made that decision. It was a heck of a decision to make, but he felt uh, the, uh, the Japanese did not want to give up that if he did this, they could make their mind up, and this is what happened. As soon as that happened there, the Japanese came up. So it saved a, a big invasion in uh, Incheon that uh, we didn't have to do. So we, you know, we felt that uh, it was a worthy cause. Mm -hmm. Sorry, too bad that all these people had to die, innocent people, but this is war. Mm -hmm. And we lost a lot of people. We saw, I saw a lot of Marines. Uh, but, um, Back in those days, 60 years ago, a lot of the patients that were disfigured, had an arm off, a leg off, facial, uh, the Navy, they, they were going to set up a, a special hospital in Japan because those fellows didn't want to go home. It's not like today where they can put an arm on, a leg on, and a guy can walk. Back in those days, you couldn't do those things because we had didn't have those uh, techniques. So um, um, this is what the Navy wanted to do with the set of this hospital. And they asked me if I would like to join the Navy or stay with the Navy and go along at that hospital. Uh, back in those days, uh, you needed points to get this charge. And I needed a half a point and I had to make a decision whether to stay in the Navy and go to this hospital in Japan or uh, be discharged. So in uh, December of 1945, I uh, decided to uh, be discharged and I, they, they, sent, they sent me to the, uh, the Philippines and I to uh, wait for a ship that took me back to the States. But the thing that I remember the most, that I'll always remember on Okinawa, I mean the battle was something that a lot of people see. But that night I worked on the ward and I got off about 11 o'clock in the morning and my buddy and I were in our bunks when we heard this tremendous sound. And we looked up, and every our tent just blew right away. 
everything blew all over. And luckily we had a, a Jeep that was that we had. And I grabbed a hold of that, giving the whole reason. If this had happened, this type of this year, uh, type, if this typhoon had happened in May, the Japanese would have won Okinawa because it leveled the island. Not I just thought the whole island was leveled. So it was a good thing it happened in October, right? some first or second week in October, I can't remember. But um, we had to work to get all of the, uh, the patients in, brought into um, our different caves. We had uh, different uh, areas that we could uh, protect them from. Uh, and we worked for uh, 72 hours. I, I didn't get any sleep or anything of that sort. And, uh, and I was a Dan of several other people who award, a meritorious award for what we did by uh, Admiral, I uh, can't remember his name right now. Price. Admiral Price, yeah, Admiral Price. Admiral Price uh, awarded us a, a meritorious award. So that's one of the things that I got, that I remember. But uh, the hurricane was, um, it was devastating. Uh, it was, I mean, you couldn't go anywhere. Everything was blowing all over the place. Um, were all the tents from your all the tents, the officers' quarters, yeah. everything was down. Our hospitals, uh, you know, we just made a tent. They were like mm -hmm. uh, 16 by 16 feet by 50 feet. You know, and all the patients in there. So we took the most uh, ambulatory patients um, uh, to safe to safety as much as possible, and uh, it, it, it was rough. But again, I talk about the CBs after it. Um, after the storm subsided, uh, the CBs, within a week's time, got us back in shape. Put, they came in by droves and they just put us all together. And that's another thing, you don't hear too much about CBs. And yet, the CBs are very important people uh, during the war. Uh, our special augmented hospital, number three, um, we started to downgrade and uh, they decommissioned us in August, yeah, in August of 1945. And I was assigned to our sisters, or Bennett Hospital, or Bennett Hospital number six. And our the commanding officer, Captain Adam Quitz, he lost all of his clothes and so forth. And the, one of the most funniest things that I'll always remember is that the um, this uh, Okinawan farmer was riding along with his wagon, and he had the captain's blouse on. <laughs> and when he came through our, and so we just laughed and laughed and laughed. And, uh, Did you salute? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it was the funniest thing. <laughs> but uh, they had all our clothes. All my clothes were gone. Mm -hmm. I had to, uh, they had to give me an, an, an issue me of a, a whole new set of uh, uniforms. Because um, I lost it. The only thing I had out was my dungarees and uh, everything, everything was lost. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, like I say, we finally built our tent back up again and uh, we survived it. Now you told before about going back to the States being discharged. Um, following being discharged, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Yes. The GI Bill, this is where I went to CN College, mm -hmm. right, the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And naturally I went in as a pre-med student because mm -hmm. I had almost four years of working in the hospitals and so forth. However, uh, all we met at that time in 1950-51 only took in about 75 students. Mm -hmm. There's probably 3,000 applications 
and get into Omni Med. And I probably, I was one of the 3,000, of course, I wasn't accepted. But uh, uh, I, uh, I was kind of grateful that it, it did happen. I had worked for the New York State uh, Hospital for about six months as a junior bacteriologist. And I was working in an isolated ward. Uh, but I, I just couldn't see myself working behind a Bunsen burner for the rest of my life. And I wanted to be in the medical field. But, uh, so. I had an opportunity one day. I was playing golf with a fellow, and he told me that they were having a um, uh, recruiting coming up at the Scotia, that they needed people uh, at, for the hydrographic office, and if I would be interested. And I said, "Yeah, well, I'll take it." I didn't, wasn't working at the time. I gave up my job as, as working for the health department, state health department. Uh, so I uh, I went to work. And uh, I spent 30 years uh, with the Defense Mapping Agency. Mm -hmm. I was a senior cartographer. But 19, uh, we had our 50th class reunion at Siena. And uh, Dr. Eugene Drago, who is a noted cardiologist in Schenectady. And he was one of our classmates, and we were pretty close together. There was six of us. Uh, four of the six became doctors. Uh, and they're all dead. The only ones that are alive are Dr. Drago and I. So when we talked, he said, maybe you were lucky, Charlie, that you didn't get into medicine. Maybe you wouldn't be here talking with me. So, uh, Dave was a good woman that I am. Uh, I was in the Navy, uh, worked for the Navy for 30 years, and I enjoyed that because I had my training in the Navy. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? Yes, for a whole year. Did you? Okay. Good for you. <laughs> um, did you join veterans organizations at all? I belong to the um, post, American Legion Post 70. I belong to the um, VFW 420. Let's go. Um, I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus. Okay. Um, we have a an organization um, of federal employees. It's called NARF. It's the National Association of Retired Federal Employees, mm -hmm. uh, and I participate in that. I was the vice president of this organization at one time. But let me just say this, of all of these activities that I'm in, in with, I find that being a docent <laughs> at the Military Museum in Scotia is probably one of the greatest things that I've ever had. Uh, I just can't wait and do enough for this. Um, uh, the, the people here are very nice, I enjoy working, coming to work. It's not work, it's really pleasure. Uh, Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No, because most of the, uh, my friends were from Chicago, mm -hmm. from Maine, uh, California, Glendale, California. These were fellows that, uh, that uh, Pennsylvania, Herb Miller, who became a, a doctor in Pennsylvania, eventually one day. But uh, no, just cards, mm -hmm. and then eventually uh, mm -hmm. sight unseen, you just kind of forget people. Do you ever have any reunions or anything? No reunions. Mm -hmm. I had no reunions, um, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. sure how, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, uh, like I say, I had that basic training in the State Guard, which was very helpful. Um, and it became a lot more mature in some of the things that we saw, that I saw, that are 
are memorable. Mm -hmm. The typhoon, I remember, yeah, the, the typhoon is probably the most that I'll always remember. But the officers, again, the, the doctors uh, that I worked with uh, were such real gentlemen. They, uh, they realized that they put their, their, uh, their doctor business away. And when we were in Okinawa, everybody was, we had to work together to get things done. And like I say, well, these doctors had, uh, I remember Dr. Uh, Dr. Haswell and Dr. Fett, who uh, formed uh, our recreation for us, uh, baseball fields. But uh, Dr. Haswell was a great guy. He um, just worked right along with us and uh, went on guard duty and took a chance of getting killed like the rest of us so, um, when we had our permanent guards. Now you have some photographs uh, you want to show us? Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of recreation, did you get a chance to see any USO shows on Open Hour? Yes, we had, uh, we had a, uh, the, the CB set up a, uh, uh, a movie screen for us. So we did see movies mm -hmm. after the world was mm -hmm. like in uh, September and October. And, uh, um, so we did have that. Uh, we had, uh, I'm not sure. Well, we didn't have Bob Hope, but we had people come in there and uh, do some uh, things. Of course, Tokyo Rose, I must say one thing with Tokyo Rose, we, uh, the whole time we were aboard this, uh, this ship, the day star, uh, she played the best, all of the best uh, music that, uh, of our times. And she, she would say, don't you wish you would be back home rather than fighting some poor Japanese people? Uh, another thing that bothers me, uh, and I don't like the way they say that, but I guess it's true, it's true, is that they, they say Okinawa, the last battle. In Okinawa, we lost more people in Okinawa. We lost over 8,000 sailors. We lost 35 or 40 ships. It was a, a real invasion, uh, and, and to say it's the last battle, of course, at that time there, the, the European war was all over with. Uh, they talk about, you know, all the things that the Army's done, and um, I want to try to keep something in record about what the Navy done, especially the hospital war. But, uh, I had this, oh. This is uh, my. Uh, if you hold it like that, Wayne can focus on that. My three brothers that were we were in the service. Yeah. Now you mentioned the one was with the 27th Division, and then the and Air, Air was, Corps was, he was in the Europe. Was he in Europe? In Europe, yes. Okay. He got shot in Europe. Okay. Here's the old picture. Of the, uh, what can what do you want if you if you turn the album around and just you know hold it like this, uh, Wayne can focus on it. Okay. Bring my glasses. I should have used my glasses. <laughs> okay, this was the uh, the U.S. Uh, Day Star that trans uh, transferred us from California to. Uh, can Florida. you get them focus on? No. Uh, this is a copy of my award that I got, and uh, this is the villages. Uh, the, the open islands. If you can tilt that up a little oh. bit. Okay. And the girls. Um, <clears throat> these two fellows were from Amsterdam, and we met on Okinawa. Here I am here, and um, the, if the... Now you knew them before the war? Yes, okay. yes. Dargish and uh, John... Uh, it's been 60 years. <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, 60 years ago, today, I was still in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Uh, here's some of the pictures that... 
And like I said, we had a photographer, and he did. He went around and took pictures for us and gave us uh, pictures. This is what our, our tents looked like. Uh, they weren't very comfortable. It wasn't the Holiday Inn. This is the devastation after, after the uh, hurricane hit. I think we lost, we lost, I don't know, 35 or 40 ships. There's some pictures of some dead giants. Uh, and here's a picture of the, the fellows. Now, are you in that photograph? Um, in the bottom, I think. In the bottom, yeah. <laughs> Uh, these others are uh, just stateside. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is where we did our uh, extensive training at the Special Augmented Hospital. Uh, uh, this was uh, Bing Crosby's old racetrack, and it was uh, well, you can see the condition it was in. And this is where we slept. I mean, they tried to make it as real as possible uh, of jungle warfare. And uh, this was my really best friend. This was in in, um, in Florida. And I could have stayed in Florida with this mm -hmm. couple here and in the Navy to the end of the war. Uh, you can see here. There's a, picture of me out here somewhere at the, at the beach. Oh yeah, here we are. You say you had a nice girl, Peggy. Well, waste not going like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say we'll blank it out for you. <laughs> but here's some of my buddies at Stateside that I was attached to. Mm -hmm. but, um, this was in California. These, all these fellows went with me on the, the Battle of Okinawa. Walt was from New Jersey, great guy. I learned more about medicine from him. He was actually a pharmacist himself. He had his mm -hmm. own pharmacy. And this is my best friend, Dr. Haswell. He and I were, we are. You never kept in contact with him? Never got in contact. This fellow's name was Dr. Powley. We used to have some fun together because we get our mail I'm Rowley and his is Powell with a P. So uh, he was a dentist and realized that these guys were, I mean, we were all together and uh, enjoyed life. Okay, there we are with our Thompson submachine guns. Okay. You can see these things are 60 years old. And, uh, These are fellows from Amsterdam. He was a, um, a signalman. And that's the, one of the reasons I wanted to join the Navy because uh, he was my best friend. He got the signal, uh, signal for and mm -hmm. I wanted to go. And here I am uh, in um, Cecil Field. This was our component. Uh, I think I'm right up here somewhere. But this. Um, These are all the foremen and the doctors. Foremen and all the doctors, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, like I say, the, uh, the Cecil Field was a, the, uh, the last step uh, before uh, the Navy, Navy pilots. They had to take this field carrier landing, mm -hmm. practice field carrier landings on, you know, regular right So we had a lot of people with accidents. And yeah, that's my last, this is, the state guard that I was in, 
And here I am right here. I was 17 years old. And this was my commanding officer, Captain Osborne. And this was back in um, July of 1941. And that's it. Okay, well thank you very much.